In this problem, we're asked to calculate the minimum amount of energy required in joules to completely melt 130 grams of silver, which is initially at 15 degrees Celsius. So this is a problem regarding heat. Heat is energy in transit. We're going to add a certain amount of energy to an object. Uh, we'll call that the heat. And that's going to, first of all, change the temperature of the object. How much it changes the temperature of the object depends upon the mass of the material I have, the mass of the object. Depends upon a material specific quantity the specific heat. If I've got a small specific heat, then I don't need to add very much energy in to change its temperature. If I've got a large specific heat, like that of water, I have to add a large amount of energy in to change its temperature. So that's an empirical quantity which I can look up in a textbook or, or you can measure in calorimetry. And the amount of energy that's required to change the temperature of an object depends upon how much I want to change the object's temperature, of course. So if I want to change the temperature by a large amount, this delta T, this change in temperature, is large. It's T final minus T initial. For a large temperature change, I need a large amount of energy. So if this, this, this goes up, then if the right-hand side of my equation goes up, then the left-hand side of my equation goes up as well. So this is the heat which is added in to change the temperature of an object. So we're going to be adding energy into our system, and that's going to be raising its temperature. The system silver is going to be raising the temperature of the silver until the silver heats gets to the melting point. At that temperature, we continue to add in heat. That's also Q. Uh, however, we're not changing its temperature anymore. We're now going to be adding in uh, energy, and that's going to be breaking the bonds and changing the phase of the object, and it's going to be melting it. Uh, and uh, that's the heat that's required to do that depends upon the amount of material we've got, once again, the mass of the object, and it depends upon a material-specific quantity called the latent heat of fusion. Uh, so this is a, a latent heat of transformation. We've dealt with two of these in class. There's the latent heat of fusion, where, uh, which is the energy required to either go from solid to liquid, if you're melting, or the other way around is to go from melting to solid. If you're fusing an object there, you're taking that amount of energy out. Uh, or the other latent heat uh, is the latent heat of vaporization, where you go from a uh, liquid to a gas, okay, or to a vapor, the latent heat of vaporization. Okay, so this Q here is the total amount of energy which is required in order to first raise the temperature, that's the left hand side, and then to melt the object to change its phase, that's the right hand side. Right, so we can see that the mass here is a common uh, factor, so we can take the mass out, we can then write that uh, it's C, the specific heat, times delta T, remind ourselves that uh, delta T is the change in temperature, so T final minus T initial, and We've also got the latent heat of vaporization. So, and the one thing I will point out is that uh, usually when it comes to looking at the energy or the heat uh, for a phase change, uh, you have to choose whether this is a, a positive amount of energy or a negative amount of energy. Uh, you know, fortunately, uh, for the heat associated with changing the temperature, uh, then uh, this delta T automatically gets that to, for, gives that to you. If you're raising the temperature, then the, the final temperature is going to be greater than the initial temperature. That will be a positive quantity. So a positive energy is the amount of energy you're adding into the system. So if I want to change from a uh, solid to a liquid, you know you have to add energy in. So I have to put in that uh, plus sign there. I'm adding in pos uh, energy in. That's, that makes sense to me. Okay, so are we ready to put some numbers in? Well, uh, do we have all the numbers? Uh, we've got uh, the mass here, we're told is 130 uh, grams. Uh, we are not told what the specific heat is, but we can look that up. The specific heat for silver in this case here is going to be uh, 236 uh, joules per kilogram per Kelvin. The uh, other quantity we don't know is the latent heat of fusion and uh, I've given that in a textbook as well as 105. Now that's in kilojoules uh, per kilogram, so I have to be a little bit careful about that. I've got a, a slightly different unit here, and we'll come across that, uh, how we treat that a little bit later on. And the other thing I don't know here, I know my initial temperature is 15 degrees Celsius. What I don't know is my final temperature. Uh, that final temperature, that's gonna be the melting temperature. So I could look that up, and that's uh, 1,200 at 35 kelvins. So I have to be a little bit careful here as well because my melting temperature, my final temperature is in kelvins and my initial temperature is in degrees Celsius. So um, really there's a few different units running around here so I might need to remember I need to convert everything to SI. Uh, what I might do is just do a little bit of a unit analysis first of this. Um, so first of all let's start with the specific heat. It's given in joules 
per kilogram per Kelvin. That means we want that change in temperature to also be in Kelvin. Okay, that way the Kelvin will cancel with the per Kelvin. It's like Kelvin divided by Kelvin. It's, it's unitless. All right, so in order to for that to be the case, for T final minus T initial, I need to convert my initial temperature into Kelvin. Remember, that's just going to be 273 uh, plus 15. So that ends up being 288 Kelvin as my initial temperature. Uh, now inside that uh, bracket, that uh, large bracket, I also have uh, my latent heat of fusion. So my latent heat of fusion here is given in kilojoules per kilogram. And that's a different uh, unit to my joules per kilogram. So in fact, I want to rewrite my latent heat of fusion in terms of joules per kilogram. So that's 105 uh, multiplied by 1,000, 105,000 joules now per kilogram. So that, uh, if I use that number there in red, then I'll end up with something which is in joules per kilogram. And we can see uh, that if I, um, these two units will of course cancelled out. Uh, in order to calculate cancel out kil per kilogram, I need to multiply by a mass which is in kilograms on the outside. Okay, so that means I need to remember that the mass here, uh, I shouldn't write as 130, I should write that down as 130 by 10 to the minus 3. That's how many grams there are in kilograms, that's in kilograms. Or if you like, you could write that as 1, 2, 3, 0 0.13 kilograms. That's how many kilograms of silver I have. If I do that, then my kilogram will cancel with my per kilogram and I'll end up with just joules. Okay, so joules plus joules has the units of joules. It's a unit of energy. Right, so let's go back and put some numbers in here. So the total amount of energy or the heat that I need to add to my system is going to be dependent upon the mass, which is 0 0.13 kilograms, multiplied by my specific heat, which is 236 joules per kilogram per Kelvin multiply by my change in temperature, T final minus T initial. Uh, so 1, 2, 3, 5, minus 2, 88. Add to that the latent heat of fusion, uh, which is in uh, joules per kilogram, so it's 105,000. Let's put those numbers in. So that first term ends up being 223,492 uh, joules per kilogram and that's 105,000 joules per kilogram. Uh, okay, and so finally, putting those together, I get 0 0.13 multiplied by 328492, and that's equal to 42,704 joules. I'm going to write this with the same number of significant figures as what I was initially given, uh, which is 3. So you'll note here that 130 grams has 3 significant figures, 15.0 degrees Celsius is three significant figures. So I can write this as 42.7 uh, kilojoules. That's really the best representation of the amount of energy that I, that I can have here. Uh, so we should always do a check at the end to ask if this is reasonable. Uh, so certainly we've already done a units check. Um, I wanted to just briefly mention here that usually the energy which is associated with the latent heat of fusion is going to be all, all the energy associated with the phase change is always much larger than the energy that's required to change the temperature of an object. Uh, that's certainly the case that we see in one of the checks we regularly make when we're dealing with uh, with, with our questions which involve things like water. Of course, with a metal here, uh, since its melting point is so much larger, it's not unsurprising that the energy that's required to heat the object up to its melting point is so large. In fact, that dominates here compared to the energy of transformation. That's a little bit different to what we've come across with, say, water and ice and uh, etc.